If you want to pump your body and expand your mind, there's only one place to go. Mind Pump. Mind Pump. With your hosts, Sal Stefano, Adam Schaefer, and Justin Andrews. In this episode of Mind Pump. Another episode. Ooh, ooh. For the first 45 minutes, we do our introductory conversation. We talk about the upcoming Mind Pump Tour. Look out. Yeah, man, we're going on tour. We're like do we a, get a van or what? Like are we going to have that landing page up by the time this airs? We very well should. I think we should send it out to the forum members first Okay. for, for first dibs. Yep, there you okay. go. Mm. And then we'll uh, push it out. That's it. We talk about the growth and the future of podcasts. We talk about diet, inflammation, and autoimmune issues. Trump potentially legalizing sports gambling. What? Is he winning more? He's, he's Biff. We talk I'm about Adidas and their first 3D printed shoe. Yeah. yeah. These are getting expensive on the black market, Adam said. It's kind of crazy. And the recycling of fashion and music. Then we get to the questions. The first question was, this individual is not really that concerned with aesthetics. They just want to be functionally strong. Do they still need to do curls? My kind of guy. Curls for the girls. If you don't, if you want girls, you better do them. The next question was, uh, this person wanted to know about psychosomatic pain. Psychosomatic attic insane. This is when you have uh, <laughs> pain in your body. Insane in the membrane. <laughs> that is coming from oh. your perception. Maybe, maybe not a physical problem, but you're perceiving the pain. It's actually far more common than we think. In fact, separating it from the physical causes of pain are very difficult, maybe almost impossible. The next question was, uh, you know, as far as the no BS six pack formula is concerned, uh, is there any benefit for someone to do it, even if they're not going to ever get a, a six pack or ever get lean enough to get a six pack? In other words, if you got a belly, do you still benefit from training your core? hell? Yes. I mean, what's, yeah. yeah. Why? Yeah. <laughs> and the yeah. final question was, what were the biggest revenue enhancers that we found in our careers for our independent personal training? businesses we answer that in this episode mm. also i talked about the no bs six-pack formula it's well, free it's not just free according to the way doug wrote it it's free free like all you gotta free. do is enroll in one of our maps bundles now maps bundles are where we take multiple programs combine them together and then doug gets crazy and slashes slashes the tires price. he oh. cuts it down by 20 to 30 percent off for example our super bundle is a year of exercise program. What we've done is we've strung together several MAPS programs. So you go from one MAPS program for three months, you go to the next one, you go to the next one, you go to the next one. At the end of that year, you look fucking awesome. It's a full year, all planned out for you. and Gar it's That's a guarantee. And it's Sal. discounted. And you get the no BS six-pack formula for free with that. Now, if you don't want to get a bundle, maybe you just want to get an individual MAPS program. We'll, we'll check this out. Let's say you're interested in maximum muscle size and strength. That's your goal. Well, then you enroll in MAPS Anabolic. Mm. Let's say you want to sculpt and shape a symmetrical body, or maybe you want to compete on stage like a bikini, bikini competitor or a physique competitor or a bodybuilder. Well, that's MAPS Aesthetic. Maybe all you care about is moving like a freaking panther. You want to be a functional like a jaguar. athlete. Well, that's MAPS Performance. Maybe you want to work out in the privacy of your own home, or maybe you travel and you don't have access to equipment all the time. You want well, to get weird sometimes. Maybe well, you then, have any friends. Well, then do MAPS anywhere. Or maybe you're a personal trainer and you want to increase the amount of tools you have in your toolbox to train your clients. Or you just want to be able to correct muscle imbalances, fix some pain you may, have, may be having in your body. That's MAPS Prime and MAPS if Prime. If you're Pro. a trainer. If you're a trainer, you must have this because the future of clients buying personal training, they'll be asking people this. Do you have Prime Prime Pro? I can't buy training from if, you if you Basically, don't. Yeah. if you don't get it, Adam will punch you in the face. That too. You yeah. can get all of these programs and the bundles and get access to the No BS six-pack formula for free at mindpumpmedia.com. After a meeting like that, we're going over our agenda. Did anybody else? I feel tired. <laughs> I'm exhausted. I'm exhausted. Too much. That's I'm exhausted lot. knowing what we have to, what we're about to go do. And I'm like, uh, uh, you almost just want to show up and just be like, all right, let's let's do it's this. Too much. Otherwise, just, yeah, it is. It's a little a, no, it's not too much. It's a yeah. lot of stuff, but it's a lot of fun. But you know what it is? It's it's out of it our is comfort. Fun. 
You know why you're tired? Same reason why I'm tired. What's that? It's mean? stuff that's slightly out of our comfort like, zone. Oh, we have to figure this out. Yeah, uh, that's all it is. <laughs> is yeah. We're used to winging it. Oh, yeah. we gotta oh, do, you, we gotta prepare. You oh. know, and, the, and you know what's funny? The amount of preparing and planning that's going to be is like a thirty minute to an hour. <laughs> yeah, conversation that already <laughs> yeah, just but, wins us. Yeah, we're like, like what? Whew. We got to oh, plan no, something for that long. Is it worth it? Yeah, usually, yeah. I, usually I just show up and make things up. Yeah. God, that was my, it's my whole fitness career. <clears throat> just kidding. Mostly. I'm yes. excited. Out, out of the events, let's see, we got four events ahead of us. We got Paleo, we got mm. Dosist, mm. we got Mir, and we got Viore. 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 Of, the, of the four, easy. What, what are you most excited about? Come on now. Ooh. Dosist. Easy. Yeah. Easy. That, that is going to be a real fun one. It's a, it's a, it's a, let's see, it's an event for, with cannabis. We're gonna talk about cannabis and try it. Mm-hmm. Like the, you know, you know what else I call that? There's another name for that. It's called a party. It's called fun. <laughs> yeah. No, but I mean, yeah. all joking aside, it is an event. But it, it's it's awesome because I don't, I don't know very many other. Are we the only fitness health like business? I guess that's partnering with a, an actual cannabis company. Or are there know. others? It's a good question. I know CBD's been in fitness yeah, now for a while. Yeah, yeah. There's, I mean, ben but not does. like actual like cannabis. You know what I'm mm-hmm. saying? Yeah. I don't know about that. Doug, do we still have our... You know what? I forgot about yeah, that. Do we still so. have a discount for Ben Greenfield's uh, CBD supplement? Oh, well, that's right. We probably do, but I don't recall what it is. Oh, my God. Mm. You know, I don't remember what it was either. Here, you know what I'll do? I'll text Ben right now. Yeah, ask Ben what yeah. it was because I, I know that when we uh, we announced that way back whenever it was, whenever the, I think it was like the second time we had him on the show, there was a lot of people interested in that, that mm-hmm. supplement. So I know we have a discount code for floating out there for people. But anyways, yeah, so I know companies like like him that have CBD and, and shit like that that they're connected to, which is cool. But yeah, I don't know any health and fitness podcasts or health and fitness people that are talking. No, that we're not gonna, openly embrace We're it. not going to be the last that's going to be exploding. Yeah. Oh, it's I, a growing- I agree with that. I'm more excited about Viore. Uh, yeah. I like Viore. Viore's going to be a cool- it's clothes. You like clothes. And I do. I do. <laughs> I do like- You're right. That's probably what it is. Dude, they, have, they make nice stuff, except for the sleeve here. Look what, look what happened. Oh shit! What the happened? Sleeve tour. What? Uh, the sleeve tour. Yeah, a little bit. What? Well, I mean, you were you chewing on it or I'm, something? Uh, you know, I got I'm muscular. Yeah. You know what I mean? You've been getting too many it's, gains. It's a lot of yeah, the gains. Is that is that the does it have the thumb slot? No. So here's what happened. So the sleeve first it opened in the middle, and I'm like, oh cool, it comes with the thumb slot, and then I'm like, why doesn't the other? He <laughs> <laughs> pulled on the thread. Yeah, and then I'm like, oh, oh. It's, cause it's, it's not supposed to be like that. I see. And then it broke. Why did you say something? I oh. just did. Well, no, I mean, not to me. Like, <laughs> I, like I the one who it does it. It literally did. Hey, you should have told- I don't care. I'll still wear it. Nobody cares. Like, can you tell? No. No. Cares. I mean, it's not even- a, I mean, we're making a bigger deal of what it really is, but Taylor- I, You should have told Taylor. Taylor yeah. would have- It's hit the gains. Hit him, yeah. him up. It it's is the, the gains. gains. It's You're the gains. Dude, did you guys- it. Did you guys read the link that I sent you guys yesterday? I know you never do, but yesterday I thought you might- <laughs> I do a I lot do of times. What link? What link? The one on, on uh, the podcasting reports that are coming out. Oh, oh no! But I read your. Oh, I step. saw your report, and then I added my own report oh my to see if you'd read it. So yeah. I think that's what happened. I did read your report. You did? Damn yeah, it. of course I did. Fox. I'm gonna read I it know, right I'm now. I'm fucking asshole. Just to say, don't lie. I'm gonna read it right now. Shoot! No, no, no! Come on! Shoot! 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 Yeah, I. Uh, you mean with it, where I like how it's growing dude, year over year? I'm gonna pull it up right now, because uh, Edison. So Edison Research does research on, or does research on podcasting and light bulbs, dude. Uh, mm. The they mastered that twenty six percent growth year over year so far, poised to double, poised to double. Like the like podcasting is exploding. That totally does not surprise me. Exploding. Mm. Just course. feel just the feeling right now about podcasting and like how many people are actually talking about. It. I'm running into people at like a gas station that know asking me about podcasts and stuff. Well, yeah, so like, so so the title of the article says. Edison says podcasting's share of ear doubled in four years. I don't know what share of ear means. What does that mean? Do you guys know what that means? Share, share and ear. Share say of ear. Like, say that again. Pod, I, the share of, do you know what that means, Doug? Obviously, radio podcasting is all going into the ear. It's audible. Oh, So you're getting shit. more ears. So if you have a big pot of 100 ears, we're taking more of those ears. Oh, so our share Ear of is the currency. Our share of the of the type of audio that people listen to or whatever has doubled over the last four years, and it feels like that because we've been on air now for over three. Mm-hmm. So we got in right as that started to happen, and it feels like that. Oh, it, I remember just a year ago. You know, if I told someone asked me what I was doing, and oh, I, I'm on a podcast. What's a podcast? Yeah, what's a podcast? 
where now not only does everyone pretty much know what a podcast everybody is, has one but i was I, <laughs> right i was yeah. I, I ran into so uh katrina and i were at um jack london square last the weekend before last when i went to the warriors game yeah and i ran into a, a dosis booth so there was like this they had this outdoor uh you know thing going on what do you call those like a little you know, fair yeah. tent or something yeah, yeah. tents and, and yeah. what is it what is it what am i what's the word farmer's market i don't know no son of farmer's <laughs> market <laughs> i just pictured a bunch of yeah, tents and yeah that's what it is though i can't festival think about, like, yeah like a display. festival thank you that's oh, a better that's so, a better word yeah, for it, so, it. jesus festival for lack tough. of a, lack of a better word very, right very, very tough word. so they had their they had their little booth there and uh probably like seven eight employees there and I walked over with Katrina. I'm like, oh, this. I was telling her, I'm like, this is one of the companies that we're partnering with right now. I'm like, come over here. Let's check it out and say hi to them. And so we say hi. Now, all of them are like, I mean, uh, Taylor and myself, we're talking to like the CEO of the company and like the main people. Like these are obviously just employees that work for them. And so they didn't know who the fuck I was. And I walk over and I go, um, oh, man, we're, we're partnering with you guys' company. And they're like, oh, really? Who are you? And I kind of tell them what I am. And I'm like, oh, I, I, you know, do you guys know what podcasts are? And they're like, yeah, of course. And they're like, I love podcasts. I'm like, oh shit! And right away, my next thing, if someone knows what a podcast is, I always want to hear who's your favorite, who they listen to, yeah. because then I know if they're like listening to someone like us or not, you mm-hmm. know. And what I thought was crazy was there was there's probably I think there was five or six of these employees. They all listen to podcasts. I made them all tell me their favorite podcast. Mm. None I was familiar with. Yeah. A lot of that, them murder mystery, the ones I've talked to. Yeah, that's always popular. Yeah. NPR, murder mystery are like for sure the, probably the tops that I hear. But I thought that was crazy. That, that is crazy though. You know, that all these guys and girls were listening to podcasts and I wasn't familiar with any of the names that they hmm. said. I thought, whoa, that just showed me like how much- What this, were the genres that they're- just- Well, one of them was a murder mystery type of one. Um, one of the guys, uh, it was like an entrepreneur one. Um, See, that's the thing about podcasts that's really cool is that if you have a specific interest, you can find several podcasts that relate to your specific interest. So if you're mm-hmm. into like dirt bike racing, for example, I guarantee you I can find a podcast that you know might cater to that. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, so, if you're into any hobby, I mean, you can get so specific to that. Well, like- and, and fitness is not is is not a super niche market. Fitness is pretty big, but just yeah. three years ago, if when you looked up fitness podcast, there wasn't a whole whole lot of choice, and now it's exploded. Oh no, it's big. It's it's really exciting. It's exciting because mm-hmm. uh, well, I mean, it's obviously what's happening. Old media is dying. New media is is replacing it. And some of the old rules apply. So things that people liked in old media, people will like in new media. Well, but a lot of new rules are happening. Are cre- what's being interesting created. with that? I just yeah, I read something too that was talking about how like the home podcast is dying, right? So like the old way of like you know just starting up a podcast and like like there's more standards now of like having like high production. Oh, yeah. I just literally talked about this in the interview uh, this morning. I got interviewed by this girl from Australia. And it was, it's a business podcast. And I was just telling her that, you know, probably one of the most overlooked things, because she was asking about the collaboration of each one of us, right? Including Doug. And I said, man, you know, Doug's role in this whole thing is so much more important than we talk about or we share because the sound quality of, of your show is just as important as the quality, the clarity of your TV that you watch every day. Mm-hmm. And I guarantee that, and it's just not, it's just not as, podcast just is not as popular as TV is yet, but when it becomes, the standard will elevate with that and those that have the high resolution, have the high definition, have the incredible sound quality, everybody will only listen to that. Well, right now it's still... It's kind of like the wild, wild west where anybody could just fire up a podcast, put a mic on your computer and start going. Mm -hmm. But soon... It's no different than, you know, when you would listen to the radio when you're driving your car. Even if there's a good song, if it's coming in fuzzy, you have a tendency to want to change. Mm -hmm. So it's really not any different. If If someone's listening to a podcast and it sounds like... You're in your bathroom. Yeah, and, or lots and, of cars are driving by, a bunch of background noise. And a lot of them are like that. A lot of them, you listen to them, and it sounds, it's very echoey and whatever. As the competition increases, you're going to you're gonna want to clean that up because it'd be very hard to compete in this market. It's not going to be, it's not too long from now where it's going to be uh, far more difficult to enter the market, and you're going to see, I think, networks. I think you're going to see more networks and stuff totally. start to happen. Because oh, right already- now, iTunes kind of owns it. Uh, you know, Spotify has podcasts now, and- 
Um, but it, it's going to be. It's we see be quite Gimlet Media and like people like that that have come through to really try and organize like legit yeah. like ABC, NBC type networks mm-hmm. that are coming and collecting these. I've podcasts. talked to several people now who were telling me that they wanted to do something online to boost their business, and so they asked me what should they do. Should they do social media, like Instagram, Facebook, whatever? And I always tell them to do podcasts. I'm a little partial, obviously, because we have ours, but I can't think of a better medium to build authority. Now, the audience that you'll build on a podcast is not as massive, potentially, as you may build on something else. Like, it's easy to get, well, it's in comparison, it's easy to get 30,000 followers on Instagram than it is to get 30,000 downloads an episode on a podcast, but... Because podcasts, you're sharing ideas, you're, you know, the, the shows are long, 30 minutes, an hour or longer, the authority that you tend to build and the, and the intimate relationship that you build with your audience is pretty insane, which is why from a, from a production standpoint, the conversion rate on podcasts is superior to anything else. And I just think it's just people are really starting to understand that. Well, even that's completely evolving and changing too. Like right now, like, so Taylor and I, we have a lot of discussions with a lot of these companies that we partner and work with. And so many of these big companies uh, advertising on podcasts is so green and new. Like they don't have any clue on like yeah, they rely heavily on like the podcaster to really determine. A they lot do, of or they use terms. this bullshit CPM yeah. that's like an average for everybody. It's and like CPM stands for what cost per. No, it's uh, CPM is cost per. Um, fuck, what's. Thousand. I think the M stands for thousand. Is that what it is? Yeah. So it's and, and so it's, it's how much you pay per thousand downloads, right? So if and you have you know a thousand downloads, what's the standard? Standard is like five to ten dollars per yeah. C, per CPM. I thought it was twenty. No, really? No, no. Standards like five to ten is what like these big companies. And are. then better ones are twenty. Yeah, better ones are like. But 20. that's all bullshit numbers. No, because we char- we charge fifty to a hundred. Yeah. So it, and it's because they're they're better we're better at it you know and that no one no one is measuring it yet and like comparing like well what is it what's a good role, like, like what is a good advertise or ad sound like on a show versus like a shitty one and so we a lot of times we have these companies that we really want to work with and they're like that's crazy we can't we can't pay that because nobody is paying that and we're like that's crazy we won't do it for anything less than that because oh, we just, we, we're not going to put our name on a brand for it's not worth it to us financially like i'd rather not do any advertising for just a couple bucks yeah. fuck off you know right. what i'm saying like it's not worth it well, to us well plus if if i if i like something i'm going to talk about it well and i'm going to show you a return and that's the bottom line yeah. if i don't know and i don't really like your stuff or i don't really know a lot about it I'm not going to want to talk about well, it. And, and I can't really fake it. So, and that's where these numbers originally came from is that there was only so many, you know, supplement companies and stuff that were out there. You know, Squarespace, I remember, was in here early. Mm-hmm. You know, there's like, there was only, I mean, there's less than 100 companies that Audible. were, that that were really it. using podcasting as a place to advertise. And, you know, everybody was advertising with them. Everybody was promoting the same shit. And so, you know, they had this average that they came up with that's like this 5 to $11 or range for CPM. And it's like, dude, that's crazy. And that's because you have all these random podcasts all advertising this random product. Like if you actually found companies and podcasts that actually mesh much better for each other, there's going to be a, a much better return, which is, and that's how like we tell, that's how we uh, tell Taylor to go about this is Taylor's always looking for, you know, cutting edge brands that we like on all levels, everything from the way they look, the product, the their service to the stuff that they do back for their community. Like there's so many things that we look at. It's like if they're a good marriage for us or a good relationship, then go after them. That's who I want you to go after and talk to. But the unfortunate part is some of these 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 big companies are just not there yet. They don't yeah. They haven't figured it there. Here's 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 what they need to start doing. They need to start figuring it out because the real estate is limited. And what's going to happen is as it explodes, as it grows, as the popularity grows, there's only so many prime spots that will be available and that's only going to drive up the cost. So if you're a big company or you're, you know, you you you've got a company you think about advertising or whatever, get into this space now because you'll save money. It's going to be a lot more expensive in the future because it's just it's just blowing up. I mean, cars now, you know, now when you get a brand new car, you know what the dashboard looks like or the what is it, the console? Or oh, whatever? Yeah, it's all a bunch of apps and like it's one your of phone. Them is, yeah, directly it, for i or uh, podcast. It used to be where you know the 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 console was you know Toyota or Ford or BMW had their own look to it or whatever. What's starting to happen now is because smartphones are so mm-hmm. awesome and the technology is so awesome, is it just throws the screen up of your phone up to the console and you just operate that. 
And you're starting to see that more and more cars. Well, and even radios and other, you know, like when you get your car now, you'll have like a Spotify app. Like a lot of times you'll have at least access to that. And what's so rad is how they've really embraced podcasting. And I'm going to be honest, dude, I think that they're going to lead the way as far as like what, you know, standard, standardizing the whole process, like making the experience better for the user. Like I really feel they're going to take charge of that. Think about it this way. Talk radio. Okay, talk radio exploded because of cars. Talk radio, people listened in their car when they're driving, when they're going somewhere. That's how they listen to it. Uh, when podcast apps or whatever are just right there on your thing, you don't have to plug anything in. It's automatic. That's going to blow up because mm-hmm. that's perfect for that well, kind yeah, of format. Because they have Waze already, you know, mm-hmm. so it's like everything you need in your car, dude, you're set. You got Waze, then you got your music, then you got your podcast. Mm-hmm. So, Well, everything's going to, I mean, Alexa and freaking Siri. Yeah. And you're not even going to have to touch it. You just say, dude. you know, hey, Siri. You yeah. Know, I mean, I, we were at my uncle's house, Doug and I, this last weekend hanging out with him and watch, listening to him. Uh, command Alexa and ask questions and stuff. That was pretty funny, dude. Really? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's it, the, yeah, it's a trip. It, I mean, it's early on still, and it's already got some pretty cool features that it, it can, and it's like he'll we'll be sitting there. We were talking one time, and we were, he was like mid sentence, and he's like Alexa, turn it down a bit, and then he went right back into talking to me, and then the volume goes. Woo. And I was like, oh shit, that's yeah, pretty. He just crazy. said a bit. Yeah. yeah, he literally said turn it down just a bit, and uh, it and it literally just turned the volume down just a bit. Whatever, yeah. <laughs> whatever that is. So cool. I know. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. I thought that was neat. He asked like some random questions, like predictions of sport games, and it like it. It's it was, all going to be done like that. Oh, it is. I mean, and then you'll it'll follow you into your car. As soon as you are in your car, your car will will be also Alexa or attached to that whole platform. Oh, yeah, your lighting, everything in the yeah. house, security. Yeah, yeah. it's It'll just it, Alexa. Order it. me. Uh, make sure I get when I come home. Get I want pizza. a dozen eggs, yeah. and yeah, whatever. And you come home, and it's already there. I remember when uh, I was talking to Tom uh, Bill you about when he. I remember seeing him as soon as Alexa like came out. He had already set his his whole podcasting YouTube all his stuff through Alexa. And I asked him, I was like, man, what's, is that the, I mean, is that a big move right now for you? Are you getting a lot of traction through Alexa and stuff? He's like, no, it's the long play. He's like, I'm just getting myself set there because the future is going to be one of the first in there. Yeah. And so it's really smart. smart. It's something that we need to do ourselves at one point because it is, it's the next, we're already talking about how the club, the car is going to be touchscreen. Yeah. But that's going to be obsolete. That's going to be gone because it'll be just talk. Yeah. It'll be all be just be talk. That's so rad. I know. So, so, uh, this is something interesting that I read over the weekend and I totally forgot to bring this up earlier. And it's a good time to bring it up. Fascinating. So you guys are familiar with uh, osteoarthritis, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, typically caused, or we think it's caused by the wear and tear on your joints. So this is where your joints start to degrade because of poor patterning or whatever. And the obese uh, population, or especially the super obese, have higher rates of osteoarthritis in their joints. And it used to be believed that that was because they're heavy. Right. Just the, heavy. the load just on the joints. So they just did this study on, uh, on mice and this is this is pointing to a direction that some scientists think may be the maybe a, a direction we need to look for people as well because so there's some other studies that point to this direction as well. They took these mice and they changed their uh, their gut microbiome. The obese mice, their joints started to heal, and so wow. now they're showing the connection between the microbiome of your gut, the, your gut health to the health of your joints. And they think that the, maybe one of the reasons why people who are obese have joint problems may not be necessarily from the weight, but rather from the systemic inflammation that's coming from wow. their gut. Interesting. Trip off that shit. Another thing that can be connected down to the microbiome, the microbiome and its Which effect made, on your total like body. Anybody you've met, so uh, much we don't know yet. You know what? It, it makes so much sense though when you think about it, because I remember all the clients that I had that were really overweight and they had joint issues. And the small trainer mind of mine would think the same thing. It was like, oh, you're overweight, so you're putting a lot of stress on your joints. That's why it they're aching. It sounds like wear and tear. Right. It just sounds like they're achy all the time. But it makes more sense now when I think about it because how many times did you guys hear this? I know I heard it all the time where, you know, it's up and down. Mm-hmm. So, like, so, I mean, their weight's not changing up and down. They're always 100 pounds overweight, but sometimes their joints feel okay. Dude. And other times they're, they feel they feel crippling. And I'm like, I never, I wasn't thinking back then to, like, assess. You know that like, study, so. Yeah, I do. I'll send oh, it to you. Send, please send it to me. So yeah. that and that's you're, it's 100 percent, Adam. Because in, in the, most of us have experienced this, where 
I don't know what I did, but every once in a while, this same spot hurts, my hip hurts, my back hurts, my my knee hurts or my ankle hurts, and, you, and people ask, well, what'd you do? I don't know, nothing. I was just kind of moving around, and maybe I woke up wrong, and we come up with stupid terms like that where I woke up wrong or I slept wrong. Like, what the fuck does that mean? Right. You slept wrong or you woke up wrong. Reality is systemic inflammation, and what happens is you probably have this autoimmune you know, response in a particular area. So let's say your right knee is what hurts. It could be a you know, systemic inflammatory response. It triggers the immune system, and for whatever reason, your immune system decides to attack that part of your body. So when your diet is off, when your stress is bad, or when you're not sleeping well, it kicks up, and that's where you feel your pain. Hmm. And that's the thing with these autoimmune issues is they target different parts of your body where I may get gut issues in terms of digestive issues when I have, you know, when, when my diet's off. Hmm. Adam may get more psoriasis. Someone else may just notice that their knee hurts or yeah. their back hurts more. More higher levels of arthritis. And the, and, and the problem the problem in the past and the problem now with dealing with these things is if I take a client and they have just chronic knee pain or whatever hmm. and they start to lose weight and their knee gets better, I may say, oh, it's because you lost weight. Oh, it's because you move better. But what we, what we didn't see before is, well, they did change their diet to lose weight and typically it's a healthier diet. And that may be... One of the reasons also is just less inflammation. I know for myself, for a fact, when my diet is done a particular way, I am just more inflamed, period. Mm-hmm. I'm just more stiff in my body. And when my diet is a different way, when it's better, I'm just less stiff in my body. Mobility is better. And that's just me, and I'm a well, I've relatively told, healthy person. I've told you before, I, I've now connected this where... You know, let's say I haven't I haven't had candy in a long time, right? Because I don't eat it on a regular basis at all, like I used to. And it's been a while, and I'm, I go to the movies, and I have a box of candy. By the time I get out of the movies, I I will find my. And it's funny because I probably did this for a very long time and didn't even notice it. Where now I've learned to connect these dots, where I'll find myself picking at my psoriasis. It's starting to. It, it'll already start itching within like two hours. And you're just more aware now. Yeah, I'm more aware of it now because like, I'll go all day, never pick, never scratch, never touch my psoriasis. But then all of a sudden, I'll find myself doing that, and I'll do be doing it mindlessly. Right, you're just kind of picking at those areas, and then I stop and I think like, oh shit, fuck, I had that candy in that movie just like two hours ago. Like, you know what makes me what makes me think about this as a parent is what make what trips me out over this is when you're an adult, you're able to put words to things that you may be feeling. So I may be able to say to you, I'm I'm anxious. I feel a little stiff. I don't feel as mobile. I feel a little down today. I'm a little hyper or whatever. Children don't necessarily have words for these kinds of things. And so what you may notice with your kids is, you know, oh, yesterday she was a pill. Mm-hmm. You know, like why is your kid randomly acting a particular way? Or, you know, couldn't sleep good last night. Right? Lately my kid can't sleep too good. Or, you know, whatever. These things affect children too. They just don't necessarily have the words uh, to put to how they're feeling. So your kid may be acting more quiet than normal or more anxious or more irritable than normal. And you just think, oh, it's just part of whatever. Mm-hmm. But it could be yeah, but how many, nutrition. How many times have you heard parents? I mean, almost every parent I know will talks about their kid and candy. Because candy literally- That's I feel, an obvious one. I feel like candy affects kids like, like it, cocaine affects adults. Oh, like, yeah. I really feel it's like, like overload for them. It is. And it's crazy when you think about it because, I mean, if I were to indulge in a box of candy, most parents that allow their kids, they, I, I got to eat a box of candy when I was a kid, but I'm double the human. Like, I'm, <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm double the human. I am three times the human yeah. I am today. Like, then size I, wise. Yeah, size wise and metabolism wise. Like, my body is metabolizing that candy differently today than it what it was when I was, you know, seven years old, eight years old, but yet I was still eating something of that size. So yeah, no, that's like a huge, it's like a huge shot yeah. of, of cocaine for a small <laughs> kid like that. And you wonder why they're acting like a little shit. And then they, then they get whiny and tired afterwards. They act all crazy. They're playful. They're fun. And you're having a good time. And then they get, oh, di- dude, I my so, so my, predictable. My kids have no idea. Uh, I mean, they know that health is important for us and we talk about it and stuff like that, but they have no idea how I manage their nutrition because I don't make it a big deal. Because I don't want to make it a big deal. I just want yeah. it to be kind of how they live. But I can I can clearly tell. I can clearly tell when my kids are eating too much uh, too much bread. There's there's my daughter will start to get like a little darker under her eyes, and mm. she her her skin feels a little bumpy near her elbow. My son seems a little bit more like he wants to just watch TV or just play on video games. If I push that too much, if they have too much sugar, I can tell. If they have too much dairy or other types, and I can just tell, and I start to change their nutrition accordingly. Yeah. 
But a lot of parents don't. We don't even pay it's attention. It's so interesting. I just noticed that too, like with bread and, and grains and um, just with my kids, because we've been doing like super gluten free and, and um, consistently doing that with the kids too. And they have rashes and stuff and like skin issues that, that come and go. And, uh, you know, like we've just been applying it with, you know, topical stuff and like trying to control it. But then it's like we just started adjusting the diet you know moving things around and boom you know they haven't had it and um it's it's been great you can wow, just really see it yeah so they have less of these rashes and random stuff. that's so fucking crazy yeah, it, was, it was tripping me out and like you know courtney's like very clinical and you know on the western side of things more so it's like i'm slowly kind of getting her to think like that in that direction a little bit but it's you know, because it's it's one of those things. It's a hard. You you want to just like apply something and like you know like treat it right away and and you know give them Dude, something. I have it. a I have a person that I'm working with. I'm coaching, and she's a dermatologist. And uh, she, I had her change her nutrition. Obviously, I'm 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 working on her on uh, working with her for typical goals: fat loss, speed up the metabolism, build muscle, all that stuff. But I always I always try to identify food intolerances because that's important. That can trigger things like appetite and health and inflammation. And so I had her eliminate all these common food intolerances and other things that we may think she's intolerant to. She just the other day texted me and she's like, yeah, she's like, it's kind of crazy the skin changes that I'm having on mm-hmm. my face and stuff. And, and so I asked her, I'm like, well, is that kind of weird for you because you're a clinical dermatologist? And she goes, yeah, it's, it's pretty weird. So she's just seeing it herself firsthand, even though... You know, in that field, when you're when you're in that Dude, they field, they do not talk to them about diet. In yeah. fact, if you bring up diet, they'll tell you that it doesn't have any. No, I I told you, and I, I mean, I've been seeing a dermatologist forever for my psoriasis, and all I get is fucking shots and They're cream. Not sell a lot of cream. Yeah, you know, shots like and creams till I'm yeah. blue in the face, man. Never once have we ever. The only time we've ever talked nutrition is the. I am asking, like, mm-hmm. have you guys read anything about this or have you heard this? And it's, I'm constantly, and they, and they kind of play like this, like, oh, yeah, no, it would be good for you to cut out sugar. Yeah, that's probably a good idea. Yeah. You know, it's like that. It's not like right. that could be a huge problem. That could be a major problem. So Jessica sure, just sure, identified, sure, sure, sure. she just identified for her that chocolate, chocolate for sure gives her breakouts 100%. Now, the tough thing about that is that <laughs> she loves it. Oh, dude, that sucks. Like, bro, like oh. she loves chocolate like there's a there's a there's a there's a very strong intimate relationship there (laughs) and and it's funny because we as we've been dating i've kind of hinted that because chocolate comes from a bean you could have a food intolerance to it just like anything else and so i've hinted that maybe chocolate could be a culprit maybe look at it whatever Mm -hmm. and she just didn't want to visit it because it was so such a powerful thing for her but she did she eliminated it and for and then we tested a couple times have a little chocolate chocolate sure enough you know, a little bit of a breakout the next day, and now she knows for sure. So she's like, "Fuck." Well, but, you know what's crazy? Yeah. It's the same thing I talk about with the weightlifting thing. Like, it's it's normally this thing that you are that you are most eating the most. Like when someone asks me, like, "Well, how do I know or where do I start?" I go, "Well, start looking at and you have your big culprits, like you mentioned." Sure. But I'm like, "Look at the foods that you know you eat the most, and we and no one knows that better than you." Yeah. Like I know for damn sure that candy and ice cream were two things I abused, hundred percent. I mean, I went fucking years with having one or other, one or the other, or both every single day. Like that for sure wow. is not an ideal yeah. situation, right? But I justified it because I fucking loved it, and I was always able to manage my weight with it. Like I could, I didn't, I could still be in incredible shape and have Ben and Jerry's and have and have hot tamales on a regular basis in my diet because I just fit my macros, right? I found a way to restrict somewhere else to allow it in there so I can indulge in this. Yep. And you know, when I, I now when I've learned to take it out and then like really evaluate how I feel, how my skin looks, pay attention to my psoriasis, and then reintroduce it, you know, and it probably took me about seven or eight times to be proven. Your, uh, ben and Jerry. Oh, oh I gotta man. know. I have mine. Uh, I, I'm a coffee guy, so I like the the coffee one, and I liked mm. uh, their baked one. Buff baked is I think is the name of it. Is it buff half baked? Half baked. Yes, yeah, that's, that, that's my jam. Yeah, right there. half baked. The oh, coffee one. It's so ridiculous. It's like it's like ha- you know, it's like cookie dough. It's like cookie dough had sex with like Rocky Road. Yeah, yeah, it's sex with a brownie. <laughs> yeah. And you know, and then uh just nothing but goodness and great. Wow. Yeah, and chocolate. Dude, yeah, I broke up with ice cream a long time ago. Fifteen to seventeen hundred calories, dude. I was it was it's putting those down a night every it's, night. It's so ridiculous. Every Jesus night, yeah. Christ. It yeah. sounds so good. I know people probably think I'm exaggerating, but 
I mean, I've talked on this show before that, you know, when I'm training, when I was training clients and when I was lifting every day, pretty much, I'm burning five to 6,000 calories. So, you know, crushing a 1500 calorie ice cream, I could do every day and not get fat. Yeah. Part of the problem is there's, there's two big problems here. One is that we're taught to, to, or, or all we focus on is our weight. So that becomes the only metric that we measure. How lean am I? And then the other problem is pretty much everything in Western medicine tells us that food doesn't affect us, except for your weight. So if you're overweight, they'll say change your food. If you have like cholesterol or lipid issues, if you have high blood pressure, they'll say look at your diet. But any other issue you have, look, go to the doctor for joint pain, go to the doctor for headaches, go to the doctor for skin issues, go to the doctor for you know, uh, brain fog, pretty much anything else. And you'll never hear them say, well, let's examine your nutrition. It's always everything else. So you combine that with the fact that all we ever do is look at weight and you end up basically creating a situation where you're extremely unaware of how food affects you besides your weight. So if you don't gain weight, but you get skin issues and joint issues and you notice that your mood is different, all that stuff, you don't make the connection because you, you don't know you're, you can make the connection. So you're just, you're just unaware. So you just walk around. You're like, look, I haven't gained any weight. So my, my joints are stiff right now. It must be because I hurt myself or it must be because I'm moving wrong or, or something like that. Or maybe it's an old injury, but you'll never look at, maybe it's my food. You know what I mean? And in fact, if you do say that, yeah. people tend to laugh at you. Could you imagine? You imagine if you... Uh, I've done this before where clients will come to me and be like, oh, you know, my back's been bothering me lately. I'll be like, well, let's look at your diet. And it's like, I have to sell them on that because at first they look at me and they're like, what the fuck are you talking about my diet? How does that hurt my back? My diet's fine. I mean, it's like you're making cells with what you just put inside your body. You know, Mm -hmm. it's like, why can't we like, I don't, I don't see why we disconnect that process so much. It affects everything. Yeah. Everything about you, your, your food can definitely affect everything from an emotional standpoint and a physical standpoint there can be some kind of an effect. And I'm not just talking about acute effects either. Of course, everybody knows that, like allergies and, and, you know, and poison. I'm talking about chronic long-term types of effects and systemic, you know, you, you can sy- change things on a systemic level, which, uh, you know, which comes from the food. So mm-hmm. pretty crazy. Ma- Ch- go ahead. No, I wanted to ask you, because I know you're, all, this is switching topics on you. Uh, you're always the one I go to for what's going on politically and stuff. Uh, have you read much on what's going on with uh, Trump and gambling and the possibility of legalizing gambling? No, nationwide? I haven't. Nationwide? Yeah, it's no. The- you know, the, the one thing I did see was that North Korea ended their nuclear. Oh my God! Program. You know what this is? You know what this is, dude? This is Back to the Future Two when when Biff <laughs> <laughs> like, became president. You know, that's what fucking Trump is. Yeah. I figured it out. Somebody needs to make a Biff meme of Trump. So, so, so <laughs> read this. Who wants to be Biff? I don't know about this. Yeah, no. So I, I um. You know, I already kind of had heard rumors about it. I, I was reading um, Hustle the other day, and they were talking about the, the Canadian poker giant, just a uh, uh, $4.7 billion bet on the future of gambling in the U.S. So they bought, they purchased a, U- a U.K.-based sky betting and gambling. It's like the world's largest online trading, like or gambling, mm-hmm. for $4.7 billion. And they're basically banking on getting themselves set up to a platform to handle all of the United States and the, and the gambling. I mean... What wow. you we've seen this transition with, and I don't know how familiar you are with like DraftKings and mm-hmm. um, what's the other big one? I uh, can't think of the name right now. All and it's all sports betting. So my buddies, we all do this. Where uh, DraftKings is, it's cool too because it's only like a few. You can play for a dollar, you know, or you can play for twenty five dollars. You can pay for three hundred dollars. You can however much money you want to gamble or risk. There's hundreds of other people that want to play and risk the same amount of money and what you and I do on these DraftKings and these sports betting ones and then and it's totally legal is we're con- we're connected and we pick from all the players and you get a salary right so I have you know 250 or it's like $25,000 I have to spend on 12 players that are playing football today and I pick you know, my Just which one performed better and gave you the most points. Exactly. Yeah. And of course, like, so if you pick Tom Brady, it costs you $9,000 and you only have, everybody has the same salary cap. Uh-huh. So we all have our equal salary caps. And so yeah. the idea it's, it's basically like fantasy football with gambling. Yeah. And so it's a way brilliant. to go around the ban on it. Yeah. Okay. So it'll, it's totally legal and they, and it's been going on for quite some time. They've exploded. But outright gambling has been banned. 
Yeah, outright sports, sports gambling. Yeah, technically outright gambling is technically banned, but there's so many loopholes around it. That's why they're going to legalize yeah. it. That's what. That's I what think I'm, they're looking at it and they're like, well, we can't well, do shit about let's this. Tax it. We, yeah, let's yeah. make some money off of it. Yeah. Exactly. So that's the, the rumor is that uh, that Trump is going to eventually I do see. that so he can get. I think it's so. It's such yeah, a stupid. We got legal weed and we got legal gambling. Like you know how much money we're. Gonna I'm kind of pro it. Yeah. Of course, kind of crazy. Well, it doesn't I'm, make any sense if right. if I'm voluntarily gambling my right. own money. Right. Why is that a that illegal? I, we're trying to control people's behavior still, which is yeah. if I'm a degenerate, guess what I'm going to be when you make gambling illegal? A degenerate. Right. It ain't going to save me. Right. It's not saving my life. Like it's ridiculous. Well, that's the thing is they can still get it right now. You know, it's not like it's going to be any different. It's going to be a lot more accessible. Mm-hmm. You know, for for everybody. But yeah, I, I mean, it's like if they were that much of an addict, they would still find a way. Oh, it's it's a hu- I mean. And you talk about things that could potentially turn our economy around. Like we've been talking about being in this dark time for quite some time, right? Ever since the real estate fuck up, right? We've been yeah. comparing us to the Great Depression and shit. But you want to talk about two things that could potentially turn <laughs> our economy around. I mean, fuck, besides the stuff like 3D printing, but yeah. I mean, legalizing gambling and marijuana. Mm-hmm. Holy shit. Mm-hmm. I mean, talk about a flux of money. And he's like, next year it's prostitution. And <laughs> speaking of 3D printing, did you guys see my Insta story? No. What? You don't watch my Insta stories. Wait, maybe I did. Which one? It's the first 3D printed shoe. Oh, I saw that. Yeah, yeah. I did see that. Adidas. Adidas, yeah. Whoa. Adidas is printing the first 3D 3D printed shoes, the soles, and I think they're I think they're going to have X amount already available. I think some are already selling, which is ridiculous. Are they expensive? The irony, this is what's funny. Cuz they're going to be super cheap at some right, point. Right, right. Yeah. So so right now because it's the first, like there's some that are selling already on the fucking black market for like $5,000. And I'm like that's so funny that because it, of course it's new and so there's people that are bidding well, it's on so it. so special. I, I mean cuz normally they just pour it in a mold, right? And so so then, this is like, what kind of material are they like making it out of? Uh, you know what? I don't. I don't know. I don't okay. know the. Fa- I don't know what makes three D printing a sneaker sole so much cooler than using a mold. I would. Inv- I would imagine what that's going to open up is the ability. Like you know how they have Nike IDs, the, the thread, custom, and yeah, like, knit. Yeah. knit. We're, uh, we're it doing it in the molds, like you're saying, is, mm. you know, there's probably a lot of money and time that goes into creating this one mold that makes tens of thousands of shoes. Well, with 3D printing, you know, you could customize on the spot and then print right up. See, you know. now that's the angle I think that would definitely make it more valuable is to add your own little custom signature, like, you know, whatever on there, logos. Well, we've been transitioning this way in the shoe industry or the shoe business. And for, Nike was doing similar stuff, but yeah, not 3D printing. Yeah, well, right. Nike, Nike ID came on the scene. Let's see here. How old was I? I remember when I bought the first pair of Nike IDs. I remember it was such a cool thing when it came out. My little brother and sister were in junior high, I think. So it was a long time ago when that... I remember that was a big deal. It yeah, was so it like, was. I remember I bought both of them. They were playing soccer when they were kids. I bought them like custom cleats with their mm-hmm. names and their numbers on it, stuff like that. That was a big fucking deal. Mm-hmm. So the, And now you can get even crazier. And all shoe brands now do it, or at least mo- all your big ones do it, where you can go buy a pair of Nikes or Adidas, and they have all these ways to change the colors and this and that. So real soon here... You know, I think you'll be able to design your own somehow, and then they three. Re- Just wait till you can own your own three D yeah. printer. Then for sure you'll be able to design your own shit. And then it, I don't know if it was you or Justin who said it, but that's where the money will be made is in the artist, mm-hmm. which I think is going to be kind of cool. Yep. I think we're going to see we're going to see like right now like uh, whoever is probably designing things for these big companies, it's probably a handful of people or a boardroom of people that make a decision where. You know, when we get to the point where anyone can 3D print, you're going to open it up to so many artists that can compete, man. Mm-hmm. And I think that's so cool. And you see little flashes of this. Like, so what's really popular right now is you'll see like Off White, right? Right now is popular with Nike, right? Um, and I forget the name of the guy who's the the artist, the designer. And you'll see these brands, they'll partner with an artist or a designer, and he makes his own custom line for Nike. And then these shoes sell for thousand two thousand dollars so you're already kind of seeing this natural progression to that anyways and so that i think is the future of how shoes will be done is you'll see collaborations with these really artistic people and they'll have the design they make it it'll still be nike who produces it for them but Mm -hmm. the artist puts their flavor or twist to it you know wow that's cool the the thing that excites me most about 3d printing is there they have the technology now but just it's new to 3d print uh with stem cells so they could literally take your cells Mm -hmm. and if you lose an ear or you need an organ they can print your uh, your heart replacement or your kidney replacements 
from your own tissue. So your body doesn't reject it. Yeah. And they've printed it to your individual specs or whatever. And now you have yourself a new organ or a new body part or whatever. So crazy. Yeah. Isn't that, isn't that, that's Dude. so rad to me. It's Westworld. Absolutely so rad to me. I can't, so. I'm so mad that you haven't got into that show yet. You're so. not watching that show still? No. God, such a fantastic show. The more you guys pushed me, the didn't more. Didn't go to any parties when you were in high school. <laughs> didn't like Game one. of Thrones either. Yeah. I know you guys like, act. Oh, I know you guys. Stupid. I know you guys yeah. like to act like you're unique and different, but really, <laughs> you're not. I'm unique. And uh, I'm my own a, person. Because you don't That's watch it. What it is. I mean, the funny part about Westworld <laughs> is like Westworld is your jam. Like I know you, I know you really well, dude. And you love Ex Machina, dude. Like I don't understand. Like this is like right up the alley. It, yeah. I think it even shits on that. It movie. does shit it's on that. So movie. much. No. It's yes. so much. Yes, one hundred percent. You're wrong. They, yes, they have yeah. a hot girl it like that. Shits on that. They have. They have everything you need. Okay. Yeah. Everything, <laughs> everything yeah. you need. Yeah. yeah. They got it all. They got it all, man. Yeah. What nude, are you selling me right now? They, yeah. Nudity. I got hey. everything you need. So. You got adventure too, right? Yeah. yeah. yeah they didn't have adventure. I got into it for a second, and then I lost interest. What are your What are your top show? What are each of your top shows right now that you guys are watching currently? the seasons right now. I watch mostly documentaries. That's the thing. That's I fine. Give, give them whatever they Billions are. Billions and definitely Westworld now. It's back. Um, God, what else? And Silicon Valley for you. Yes. Silicon God, Valley. there was- I love it. It's so funny. Justin there and was, I are like on the same one. There was yeah. one about hormones on Amazon. I can't remember the name of it that I'm going to watch. Uh, hope, maybe tonight I'll watch it. I'll let you guys know what I think. But there's some cool ones on Amazon Prime that are new. There was one on hormones. There was one on why our personalities are the way they are. It was a couple cool ones. I'll tell you guys all about it. You guys excited? <laughs> I can tell by looking at your faces. Yeah, you guys are. I love it. I want someone to make like a Steve Urkel meme. Yeah. <laughs> that's, a, that's not an old Did reference. I do that? <laughs> yeah, that's, a, that's not an old <laughs> reference whatsoever. <laughs> you know what? Yeah, I know, right? You know what I was telling Katrina? So, uh, uh, our our um, Miami Vice throwback tank tops that you just could uh, you just made, Justin. So yeah. shout out to Justin for those. Those were awesome. Those yeah, are, uh, I'm glad for, you guys liked them. That's for awesome. sure, one of the uh, big uh, biggest sellers that we've ever done. And I was telling Katrina, uh, we were looking at all the boxes came in and stuff and pulling them out. And she's like, it's she's all, it's so crazy that these tank tops did so well. And I said, well, that's what's in style right now. Like the, those colors are back. And yeah. I said, you know what trips me out is like, I literally have a picture of me, okay, wearing almost a tank top, like spot on to those colors, the color scheme you have with like, really? with the same, what like a you, trip. you did that teal and you did that pink, right? So yeah. I had the teal and pink uh, shorts with a pink shirt that looked just like that tank top and I'm rocking the checkered vans the slip on checkered vans that you guys have seen me wear yeah. so I'm I'm it's kinda, like 90s California like, well what I'm no, tripping what I'm tripping well yeah right? well, what, well, that's I, mean, what I'm tripping out about yeah I have a picture of me wearing those vans wearing that outfit that tank top and I'm at Great America with my cousin and I must be whatever however old you are in fourth and fifth grade and what's tripping me out is that that has completely come full circle. That that's what's in style yes. right now. Yeah, and I've got a photo of me wearing you know literally makes, like a timeline. You know, you could just like plot it out. You know what it makes me wonder? It makes me wonder because when we were kids, the 70, 60s and seventies styles were coming back into style. Mm -hmm. It makes me wonder if like kids growing up looking at old pictures of their parents, then they grew up to design clothes, and then that influences. Design. This is what I think. Like this is what my parents wanted. No, this, this is what I think. And this is kind of like with with style and trends what happens is there's always a, a kid or a person, you know, typically celebrity, what were celebrities back in the days with us which were like art or like um, you know, artists. TV stars. Or yeah. TV stars. That um, fall in love with an old style or something and they have the courage to wear it when nobody else is doing it, yep. and because they're already a leader and looked up to, that's what starts. Like, that's, oh, this is the new thing. Yes, mm -hmm. and it and it's it's almost always like that. It's always somebody who's got some sort of fame or power or clout, and they have the balls to say, "I'm not going to do what everybody else is doing." And it looks like everybody's moved on to this new style. I'm going to pull well, from something that you know I, what else is a humongous influencer of, of that is music. You know, yes. music and fashion, right? So if you see what like the trends in music have gone way more into the electronic end, which the mm -hmm. you know using synthesizers and all that, when was that like hugely popular? Eighties. So it's just like it's a weird like style reflection. And I think they use the same lighting. You know, it's like the same kind of a party vibe where you know people are just like you know in that sort of same like mental space. And then it's like, oh yeah, I don't know. I feel like it always like aligns. Well, like they that. do it. Just, it they so do. They do it because we we respond to it and they yeah. and there's actually and this I, I know i've referenced this book a few times since we've been yeah, yeah that's where they get into this where you know we want we want something different 
We want something that, uh, but we also want something that seems familiar. Mm-hmm. Like it can't, it can't be so different. Like, and that people are just turned off by that. If the style is so off, if the sound is so off that it's like nothing you've heard before, very few people will want. There'll be outliers, of course, but very few people will gravitate toward. But if a song has, has some sort of familiarity to it, or and it brings up a memory or a feeling that you had when you were a child or whatever, like that, and it it hits that, it's crazy that we're naturally drawn to that. And even the music I listen to today, like I'll I'll be listening to a song. And I like it. And then when I, if I really unpack the song and go like, what is it I like? Either the lyrics or what they're singing about reminds me of this one song I used to love or that I used to play when I was a kid. Or, oh, I remember this time in my life. What, what, this was the type of music I was listening to. It's- I, I just find it so fascinating how, how humans operate. I mean, humans in general are just fascinating. But it's so weird how things, like we just tend to decide what's in style, what's yeah. not in style. And it just kind of happens, or at least it just feels like it happens, and it's really weird. It's, it's like really a collective thought that everybody just uh, subscribes to. Yeah, like, oh, no, no, that's ugly. It's like, this wasn't ugly like five <laughs> yeah. years ago, Yeah. but today, everybody, what, who decided? You know, it's kind of, it's it's interesting to me. It's fascinating. It is. This Quaz brought to you by Organifi. For those days you fall short on getting your organic veggies or whole food nutrition, Organifi fills the gap with laboratory-tested certified organic superfoods to help give your health a performance the added edge. Try Organifi totally risk-free for 60 days by going to Organifi.com. That's O-R-G-A-N-I-F-I.com. And use the coupon code MINDPUMP for 20% off at checkout. All right. Our first question is from Mark in the Mountains. <laughs> Mark in the Mountains. Hey. How important is it to train arms? If I'm doing compound lifts and I'm not all that interested in aesthetics, do I need to do curls? Yes. Mm. Curls yeah. are for the girls, bro. Yep. <laughs> Next Curls question. are for the girls. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, we're done. It's as scientific we're as we're going to get right yeah. there. You know what? I don't. Is it is it necessary? No. Uh, but I do think that it is. I think, especially in the CrossFit community, this is a neglected area, and you see a lot of guys that actually get injured doing their kipping pull ups and doing some crazy show or deadlift with heavy weight. Yeah. And they just don't have this pure bicep strength. Hold on. You have any sort of slack in your arms and you go to do a pull a deadlift or you're ripping yourself up on a kipping pull up and you don't have the real bicep strength, like you hear about this all the time, man. Yeah. Well, yeah. I remember, yeah, e- even with um, you know, our, our strongman buddy Robert Oberst. Robert Oberst. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot his name for a second. Yeah, no, he was he was mentioning that he has to do that. Like even when he goes and attempts these lifts, because that's like the weak point in his kinetic chain. Like he knows that right there he's gonna if he gets it exceeds the amount of weight that like, you know, he's PRing, like his his biceps really vulnerable at that mm. point. So I told you guys this I think I told you this, the sorest I ever got my biceps, like crippling sore, was a couple years ago when we were we were doing mind pump. And it was the first time I had really tried those sandbag, the stones, you know, mm-hmm. the sandbag stones that are, it was a 200, oh, yeah. a 200 pound bag. And, uh, you know, our, my buddy over at Gold's posted a video of him for time, picking this 200 pound bag up and putting it up on like a, you know, a five foot, uh, step or whatever. Mm-hmm. And so I thought at that time I was feeling really good. I was pulling like 550 deadlift. I felt strong. I was like, okay, let me get after this. And so I did. And I did it for, I think I did 15 reps. And I don't know how many minutes it took me to do that. I don't remember. But holy shit, what was sore and was my biceps. Yeah. And I didn't do I didn't do a full contraction ever. It was just holding that much weight. It was the, tension in a in a position you've never yeah. applied yes. that much tension. And to the point where I felt I did damage and that I, I wasn't going to recover. I mean, I was fucked up for like a week. I couldn't do anything with my arms. I literally yeah. could not do yeah. any weight training with my arms. Completely fucked them up and could easily see if I would have overextended myself and like been lifting a three hundred pound stone or doing something that was really challenging. How I could have tore my bicep. Yep. I, yeah. I, I mean, like, dude, I I know that like me, I'm probably the best example for as somebody that probably doesn't do like accessory work quite as much. Like I, I'd be more prone to doing these gross motor movements. And you know, I I feel what you're what you're saying, but like I always that was the limiting factor when I was doing pull ups. I remember my biceps just like giving out that was like the first the fatigue that was like the limiting factor for even you know uh deadlifts even so i had to like get better at that so i started reintroducing bicep curls and it made a massive difference it did if it's not necessary and if you're not interested in aesthetics do curls just to strengthen that uh that particular movement pattern 
Now, if you're interested in aesthetics, of course, you could do more arm exercises to develop those muscles. But, you know, whatever movement you don't do, you, you tend to not be good at. It's just the way it works. So now if we have to do a head to head competition and if somebody were to ask me, hey, you know, uh, which exercise is going to build my arms more, you know, bicep curls or heavy pull ups, I'm going to tell you pull ups, pull ups are probably going to be more effective at building your arms. Plus, you're going to work your back and more of your body than just doing the curls. Well, and Justin's a great example of this. I mean, uh, probably arguably has some of the biggest arms right now just because I've been laying off of him. But he's, <laughs> he's de- he definitely Jailing doesn't... yourself that, he, <laughs> yeah. he definitely doesn't do curls hardly ever, no. and he's got, an, he's got huge arms. So, I mean, he's a perfect example. I look of, at gymnasts. Look at, look at Amer- like, you know, male gymnasts have... They look like mini bodybuilders, yeah. and they don't do hardly any isolation movements uh, except for maybe rehab and stuff like that. So you don't need to do curls. And if you're not interested in aesthetic, I mean, here's the deal. You know what I think is more over, and I don't know if this is a cross, does anyone, does anyone look his thing up? Is he a CrossFit guy? I don't know. I'm just assuming. I feel like that's a, I mean, that's a good guess because that's the mentality a lot of yeah. CrossFitters have. And yeah. so I think when, you know, the, the lift, the lift that I think is most neglected in the CrossFit community is the bench press. Bench. Mm-hmm. That's what I think is ne- neglected the most is good old bench press because they'll do a thousand push-ups, but I mean yeah. you're great at endurance. But let's get some strength work on your uh, chest. This is our this is uh, Mark Farrell. This is our forum guy. Oh, that's oh, Mark. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, hey, fuck you, Mark. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> come on, dude. Um, yeah, no. Uh, you know what? I think Mark is into CrossFit right now. Is he yeah. into CrossFit? Uh, I mean, he's maybe. like in the mountain. He does obviously in the mountains kind of stuff. Lots of hiking and. And functional type stuff. Yeah. I mean, here's a deal. Mark, like, you're a dork. Start awesome. doing some yeah. curls, bro. Here's the deal. <laughs> you, know, you know, if you're in, if you're interested in real functional movement, throw them in every once in a while. It doesn't need to be this crazy staple of your routine where you do them, you know, three, four days a week or whatever. Right. But I wouldn't I wouldn't eliminate them completely and think that they're not going to give you benefit by by throwing them in. But this does bring up a good point. And that point is that these these functional compound movements tend to work the body and even the arms better than the arm exercises do. If you were to compare yeah. head to head, but here's the awesome thing about exercise and resistance training in particular. You don't have to pick one over the other. You can do both. Right. So, you know, if, mm-hmm. if you can throw in some curls, hammer curls are very functional. Reverse curls are very functional. Supinated curls also have some great functionality. I personally, if I had to pick one, I would pick the hammer curl. I love the hammer curl. I get to use more of my... Uh, you know, more of the forearm muscles that are involved, this, like the brachioradialis. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think when you're holding things, your hands tend to be in that kind of hammer grip. Um, and it's, it seems to be more functional. I know Robert Oberst was a mm-hmm. huge fan of well, the hammer curl. I laid off a of concentration curls for a, a little bit of time there when we got into our little deadlift race. And I had more golfer's elbow and joint pain going on than I ever did when I was neglecting doing these curls. And so that's the thing you got to be careful with only doing the compound lifts is you get very good in that plane. Yeah. And let's be honest, your no arms out position. Your arms of all the limbs that you have, your arms are always you're always putting them in different positions and grabbing things from different angles and pulling from different angles. And so if you don't strengthen them in different positions like that, this is where I think you can get a lot of these issues arising and where isolation type movements really do benefit you. Oh, absolutely. And that's why you see it in like gymnastic, you know, rings and cause like they're going through so many angles, so many ranges of motion and they're fully, you know, muscle tension contracting the whole entire time. So yeah, definitely adding more accessory work where you hit more areas of the muscles can be beneficial. It's so funny too because, you know, 15 years ago, would would anybody ever ask that question? The right. question would never be, oh man, do I need to do curls? Like everybody was doing curls. I know. But because of the popularity of, uh, you know, functional type movements and people are doing more of these really effective exercises. Now you're starting to see Dude, people Dude, it's okay say, to bro out. You know, yeah. I'll be I'll be your guy. There's you know, benefits. Okay. There's benefits and your body adapts in in specific ways with exercise. So what you don't do, you tend to get kind of shitty out. Now there is there is carryover to other things. Here's the thing about gross motor movements. They have lots of carryover. Way more carryover than these non-gross motor movements. In other words, if I do lots of curls, I'm going to get a little bit of carryover to barbell rows and pull-ups and stuff like that. If I do bar- cur- pull-ups and, and rows, I'm going to get more of a carryover to my curls than vice versa. But that doesn't mean there isn't uh, any uh, benefit to doing them. So if you're, if you're into functional exercise and really care, care about your aesthetics, just throw them in every once in a while to strengthen those patterns and ensure that you don't get some of the injuries that tend to happen from people when the bicep is the weakest link. Next question 
Freaky Jake, would you? <laughs> he's, love, he's into stuff. <laughs> would love to hear your, you talk in more detail about psychosomatic pain. How common do you think this is? How can people diagnose and treat themselves? Psychosomatic pain is as common as uh, just the physical causes of pain. So, when you, we, I'll, I'll tell you guys a, a story, and then I'll get into what I'm about to explain here. So, uh, I've I've been dating Jessica now for over two years. And when we first started dating, she had lots of uh, shoulder and neck pain. And I, I think it was her, I want to say it was her right shoulder. Um, but she had lots of shoulder pain and lots of neck pain. And when we first started dating, I took her through all this correctional exercise. I identified it. I identified, excuse me, uh, movement patterns uh, that weren't ideal. Uh, we did correctional exercise to try to fix it. And over the course of like six months, and this was like... She's very consistent. So she's like the best client ever. Like she applies it, does it when she's supposed to. Then of course, you know, we're dating. So when I'm with her, if I have an opportunity, I can work on particular muscles. I can look at how she's moving. And over the course of that six month period, her recruitment patterns looked way better. um, Except for when she went real heavy, her recruitment patterns looked excellent. She moved everything great. The only problem was her shoulder still fucking hurt. It still bothered her. And it was a very strange thing, and we couldn't really figure out what it was. We thought it was diet. Nope, her diet was good, and inflammation was down, but her shoulder still would bother her. And so we started to unpack it a little bit and get a little deeper. And what it, she had initially heard it years prior when she traveled with, uh, with the circus. So when she traveled with the circus, she had the ability to train with these incredible artists, and she learned how to, uh, how to do the silks, and the silks are this long things that they hang and you, 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 you hang in the ceiling, you climb you them up and, of, yeah. Yeah, and you, you do the splits on them and you hang upside down and do all these other crazy things. It requires a lot of strength and stability. And she learned how to do them and she got really good at them. And it was the first uh, physical activity that she'd ever done that she was ever good at, or at least something that she'd actually applied herself to. So it changed her life. It literally changed her life where up until that point, she thought she was non-athletic. She thought she was clumsy or whatever. And now she found something that she was really good at. She was so good, in fact, that the instructors actually had her perform when they would have these big in-house parties. She did a couple performances. And so she identified with it very strongly. It changed her life. Then she hurt her shoulder. So she had, not only did she have the physical pain, but now you ha- she had to deal with the this assault on her identity. All of a sudden, something that made her who she was and she felt very confident with now she couldn't do anymore or do it like she used to because of the shoulder pain. And so, you know, I speculated, I wonder if, you're, if you've created this association with the pain, this emotional connection to the pain to where that may be causing more, more of the problems. And she thought that was kind of crazy and thought about it. And we dived in deeper. And one day she was sitting there and it kind of dawned on her and it really clicked. And she said, you know, I think you may be right. I think I, think I have this emotional attachment to this pain. And it caused more than just physical pain. It caused lots of different you know, types of problems with me, including, like I said, with, with my confidence. And within a week of that, uh, pain disappeared. And it would come back every once in a while, and then she would sit there and she would process it, and it would go away again. That mm-hmm. sounds weird. Sounds like magic, right? Except for I've seen that happen at least a dozen times with other clients. Mm-hmm. At least a dozen times have I seen people have pain literally go away by addressing the fact that it may be or acknowledging the fact that it may is be. This what, when we were down in LA and we went to, um, God, what, the human garage and they, they got like real deep into this kind of stuff with psychosomatic, uh, pain, all pain. Think about it this way. Pain is a sensation that your body's sending you. That's all the physical part is. Now the rest of it is everything else you've created around that. The fact that you don't like it, the fact that it makes you anxious, the fact that maybe that pain came from something that happened to you. Maybe it was an accident. Maybe it was a car accident, something traumatic. Maybe it was abuse. Mm -hmm. Maybe it was something like that. So pain all has this psychosomatic connection to it, which is why it's such a hard... You talk to pain doctors. Pain is one of the hardest things... Well, to 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 work with yeah it makes sense with the association of it how you like really concrete that feeling in that moment of, of you know what you experience through that and you know a lot well not a lot like food but like with food where you have associations that you remember you know nostalgic feelings and things and that's why you like you don't even remember why you like ice cream so much. well justin let me ask you this your, your wife works uh she works a lot with children right yeah in, in post-surgery and stuff like that ask her 
how the kids react post oh surgery God. versus how adults react to the same surgery. They start running and jumping. Yeah, like, and it's it, the same procedure. Yeah, it's and, crazy. And I've had I've had I've trained surgeons who've told me that like, oh, I'll remove an appendix from a kid, and I have to like keep them in bed and tell them to relax, and then I'll do the same surgery with a person, and they're like, can I take a month off of work? Yeah. And I need opiates, and I need to make sure. And can I, you know, I, I can't lift anything over ten pounds, and. Mm. And it's because kids don't know that they're supposed to react react and ways. hurt that way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Whereas adults- we, oh, I totally believe that. Yeah. yeah, we totally believe. So there's a lot that goes into this and it's not just the physical stuff that's happening. Pain can happen and, 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 I, and they cross over. Look, I'll tell you what, if you're anxious or depressed or stressed or scared, or let's say, let's, let me give you an example. Let's say in your car accident and it's a very traumatic car. I mean, I'm going to use an extreme example. It's a, it's a traumatic car accident. You get uh, in a, lots of problems. Let's say you hurt your neck really, really bad. Um, now you got to, you got to get, you know, surgery on your neck. It needs to heal. After it heals, it looks like nothing's wrong, but you still have that trauma of that accident. You're still, you still may carry yourself and hold yourself differently as a result of that which may also contribute to the physical pain. So I think it also goes to the physical pain. For example, if I'm anxious or if I'm if I'm depressed, I may hold my shoulders a particular way. Well, that may cause you know recruitment pattern issues, which then may cause pain. And so it's like it's fixing all, one may work on the it's other. It's all connected. All all the systems all work together. I mean, I fuck I love this mm -hmm. stuff because I think we're what I don't like, and I know you 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 taught you brought up human garage. I don't like um I don't want to jab at them too hard. Mm -hmm. I don't like when we try and act like we know for sure because mm -hmm. we're still learning so much mm -hmm. in this area. I no, mean, I, I totally ne agree. neuroscience and psychology are like two of my favorite places to read. And this goes hand in hand with this and what we're finding out and what we're learning about, about the brain and how it works and how emotions are made. I mean, we've all experienced this before. Everyone's cut themselves before. And until you look down at it, did it not hurt? Mm -hmm. Everyone's had that. Everyone smashed their finger, cut themselves, and went, ooh, and grabbed it, didn't look at it. And then when you looked at it, oh, yeah. then the pain then the rush comes in. Right. What was that? It wasn't like all of a sudden you got you you got the pain. It's that something your brain perceived it that way. And then it, it it's just, like an alarm that goes off. It know? is. And it and it takes a lot of of the past, like what's happened in the past, what you've seen, mm -hmm. and then and it tries to predict like what that's supposed to be. So the way the brain is is processing this information to come up with how you're supposed to feel or respond to this is extremely fascinating to me. And the power of the mind is unbelievably strong. And so I think that absolutely there is something here. But I also think that when we try and talk like experts in it, I think it's super naive of us to say that, oh, you know, if you stick your finger in your fucking gums really hard, that that's relieving this side of this and it's doing that. It's like, yeah. you know. Well, it may work like this, you know. there's By the way, these are studies. You can look them up. They did a study where they took people with knee pain and they did surgery on them. And some of the people, they just cut them and then sewed them back up. They didn't do anything else. Other people, <laughs> they cut them and went in and did the surgery. Guess what? After the surgery... The same, same percentage sequence. of people, the same percentage of people had relief. Mm -hmm. So the people where they just cut and then sewed them back up to do the particular study, who had nothing done to the inside of the knee, mm -hmm. they felt better. They could walk better and whatever at the same rate as the people who actually had the procedure. Now, why? You got to ask yourself why. Ooh. Well, when it comes to psychosomatic situations, believing is very important. So if mm. I wake up from the surgery table and I look down at my knee and I got stitches, I believe you went in there <laughs> and did some shit. I remember and, that study. It's so messed up on some level, but it, it just shows like human psychology. It's crazy. Like I wonder like if a study, if they did it where they actually draw and like have like a makeup artist, like, like look like you got cut, like you, like they cut mm -hmm. open and went through there, but didn't even penetrate the skin. Dude, how well, you feel. And you've talked about the fat and the phantom limb syndrome too. That, yeah. I mean, that's more, of this topic again too. I mean, it's all encompassed in that, right? And well, I think the problem when people talk about, because this was with Jessica too when we would talk about it, is at first when I would bring this up as psychosomatic pain, I was very careful with my language mm. because when you bring that up, people- it's real. Well, people think, them. yes, and not only that, but they think that you may be discrediting them. Yes, it, or, makes, it makes them feel like you're making uh, their, yeah. their problem that they yeah. feel is huge. It's just little. as real. If you, Whether you, whether, look, you feel it. Yeah. That's the bottom line. So it's there. Doesn't matter if there's an actual physical issue or if it's something that's emotional. 
it's there, and both uh, are. It, You're it not doesn't matter. To belittle it, yeah. No, it's no, just, it's, it's it's recognizing you, what may be causing it. You said something too about like I think that there's a lot about just how you carry yourself when you feel good too, and sure. you're positive, like. You, you made a point about the your shoulders and kind of slouching if you're sad mm-hmm. or negative or you have negative energy like that. I mean, I can tell personally if I'm in a bad mood, my low back or I feel the aches and pains in my body. When I'm in a good mood, you know, is it have is it everything to do with my mood? Maybe something or maybe it even has something to do with when I'm in a good mood, I walk with my chest up. Right. I stand up tall and straight. I activate my core. I'm, yeah. on, I'm in this like responsive like type of a mood all day long versus slouched and negative. And and so I, I think there's a lot of factors at play here. No matter how you drum it up, it is real. Yeah. There, you have the sensation and feeling of pain and then you have the feeling of that you have on the feeling of pain. Does that make sense? So it's not just the the the, the sensation of something happening. Feeling square. It's also, look, let me put it this way. If you've never felt pain in your entire life, let's say you were born without a, something, you just didn't process it, you didn't feel pain, and then all of a sudden they turned it on, and now you could feel pain, you wouldn't really know how to perceive it. You wouldn't know what it was. You'd know you felt something. It's like when people... Uh, you know, when people hear for the first time, you, you ever seen these these videos now where they do these, where people are deaf, yeah. or and then all of a sudden they can hear, mm-hmm. and at first it's overwhelming because they're mm-hmm. not quite sure how to process it. I'll give you a great example. Here's a, here's a good uh, a good analogy. You know, we all work out, we all lift weights. Does it hurt to to do heavy squats and deadlifts and curls and pull ups and shit like that? Yeah, sure. it hurts. Now, how do I perceive that pain? I fucking love it. Now, I know lots of people, when they work out, they hate the pain. The pain is bad to them. They can't stand it. Mm -hmm. The difference is I have a different connection to that pain. Workout pain to me is very different than other kinds of pain. I can tolerate a lot oh, man. of you workout guys, pain. Have you guys ever trained yep. somebody who's like has is not familiar with yep. and they yep. and they, they and they I've had clients come back It's and, like you're breaking them. Yes, they thought they, yeah. they thought you hurt them. Yeah. Like I've literally had clients sit across the desk from me and like freaking out that they can't train anymore cuz can't move my arm. Like yeah, no, you hurt me. Yeah, it's like yeah. no, you're just sore. Well, you can yeah, move your just, arm. Yeah, you've just, just never done it's that a before. New sensation. Yeah, it's just <laughs> so and they just they perceive it that way. Hey, so yeah. here's another wrong. Here's another great example. Totally. Here's another great example. I know everyone's going to get this one. Look at people who are really, really, really into BDSM. Look at people who like to get tied up mm. and get whipped and beat and I mean crazy shit. You watch, the, you know, you watch movies like, uh, you know, oh, like yeah. uh, what you would call it. What's that one with uh, that all the women were reading that book? Of great Fifty Shades Grey. Yeah. Okay. So that's not even the real deal. Like, look yeah. at the real deal. People get fucking. <laughs> so I was like, I know. Like it's, it's some, <laughs> yeah. it's some yeah. serious I'll, pain. I'll give you some websites. It's some serious yeah. pain. We'll and, remember. And these people like it and they enjoy it. How yeah. is it that their body doesn't pro, doesn't register pain like ours? No, they have a they different just connection. Change the association with it. Yeah. They have a different connection yeah. to it. So how can you diagnose and treat this? Well. First off, I think you have to do something like exercise and change recruitment patterns, A, because that can actually help, and B, because you're making a positive association. So if, if I have back pain and I'm doing exercises, now I and I'm helping my back, I am also believe that I'm helping my back. And even if my back pain is the result of depression or trauma, that suggestion should could be enough to make the pain feel like it's going away. So I think exercise is great. I think nutrition is great. And then I think just general making yourself do things that make yourself kind of feel better. But step number one is don't feel like, you know, psychosomatic isn't real. Realize that pain is pain. And if you feel something, you feel someone and it's something. And it's just as real as if it's a if it's an actual broken bone or if you just quote unquote imagining that you have a broken bone. Next question is from Dom's DC5. As far as the no BS six pack formula is concerned, is there any benefit for someone who is nowhere near getting a six pack to running this program? Absolutely. Well, in other words, is there a benefit to working your abs and core and treating them like a muscle? Yeah, right? like even if you yeah been neglecting. Yeah, because I, I know I know where this question is coming from. It's like, look, if I'm not lean enough to see my abs, right? What's the point? Yeah, what's the point? Yeah. And. I mean, it's a muscle like anything else. Like if you, oh, well, it's a, very, it's it's not just a muscle, it's crucial a, muscle. Yeah, it's a very, very crucial muscle. And you know, someone asking this question when if you're in your teenage or young in young twenty or early twenties, it's a little bit harder to get through to you maybe on this because you don't know what low back pain feels like, or you don't have hip issues, or you mm-hmm. don't got 
stuff like that going on with you, which almost every 30 plus year old person absolutely has either completely suffered from or has some taste of it and understands. I mean, that to me, the, the whole, the whole training, the abs and core area is literally just learning to have control of the whole, just your whole pelvic area. I mean, that is so important to your, to your structure. And it's very, very common because we sit in chairs, we sit in our car, we sit at our desks all day long, and that is not advantageous for our posture. And if you don't train those abs it, and support that low back, like it's it's inevitable, it, it will come. Like at one point in your life, it will it will knock on your door and it will become a necessity. It's just whether or not you learn to incorporate it into your routine now before you have the pain and before you have the mm-hmm. issue. But it's, I mean, I would say confidently 95% of all clients I've ever trained have some sort of a a anterior pelvic tilt, right? Mm -hmm. They have some, and that's weak, weak abdominals to help keep that pelvic into neutral in the neutral position and certain muscles that are overactive and underactive that are causing you to be there. And the best thing that you can do to support that would be to strengthen your core and abdominals. One of the biggest uh, areas of neglect that I see today because you you do see people working their abs uh, nowadays, except for like the the meathead, you know, beefy guy or whatever who's like, oh, I don't need to. My my core gets lots of activation, you know, when I do squats and deadlifts and stuff like that. But besides those guys, you tend to see people working a lot of abs. What you don't see a lot of is people strengthening rotation of their core, mm. which is extremely yeah, important for athletes. Really. Yeah, athletes will do it, uh, yeah. you know, and they do it like naturally too in their sport. <laughs> But the ability of your rotate to stay stable and strong mm-hmm. and rotate mm-hmm. is very important. And anti-rotate. Uh, yes, because- That's look why at- QL injuries are so common and stuff like mm-hmm. that. You always hear that. Or somebody hurting their spine just by barely you know, twisting to pick up a shampoo bottle. That's usually what I was just going to yep. say. When yep. people hurt themselves, it's usually bending over and twisting. Yeah. And Doing that, something so light and oh, simple, gardening. You don't want to be that guy. Right? Oh, it's the worst. Yeah, Story and it's that, it's that rotation that you know is so important. So like, And there's a lot of old school exercises that- I like to do like I like to do get on a Roman chair or create my own type of Roman chair. So I'll get a bench, I'll put it kind of sideways so I'm across it rather than uh, a, a, along it, you know, long lengthwise. I'll put my feet underneath something and my butt will sit on the edge of it. I'll put a broomstick or something long behind my back so my arms are stretched out. I'll crunch my abs and then kind of unroll a little bit so I'm leaning back and then I'll focus on rotating on either side as mm-hmm. much as I can. So I have resistance with that rotation. And when I first started doing that, I did notice that my range of motion would get better as I'd practice that exercise. So I could twist mm. more and more and more. And then I noticed- I love like o- way like open arm twisting. Yes. I think, I think that's so crucial. And you feel the difference when your limbs are further away from you and what kind of resistance that places under your core. It's, it's pretty crazy. I'll tell you what, man, you know, people, this is now in terms of aesthetics, people like to talk about six pack abs and you want to have a six pack and this and that. But obliques, if you have really nice obliques, I, I could show you pictures of people side by side with people who just have abs and people who have obliques with abs, way different, well, men and women. Uh, a great example to, in today's you know, weightlifting community is men's physique athletes, dude, that are wearing squeams, man. Oh, yeah. they're, they're, they're trying to make their waist look so small. No obliques. Yeah, they could have rock hard abs and if they have no obliques whatsoever, there's no rotational movements in their routine at all, man. Except for rotating to pose. Yeah, 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 yeah. Which, yeah. yeah, that's true. My that's probably the only thing. Only my left side. That's their saving grace. Dude. Fact that you, you gotta, here's, here's, oh, yeah. So if you snap in half, you, yeah. you lose. Years ago, uh, here's how I figured out the obliques were important, okay? Years ago, I, you know, when I was into like studying like, like weightlifters and, and strength athletes from a long time ago, I noticed that they all had these like strong looking obliques. And then I went to, uh, where'd I go? I think it was the Louvre Museum in Paris years ago, and we're walking through, and I'm looking at these ancient Greek sculptures of gods, right, like Hercules or, you know, whatever, Achilles or whatever, and you're looking at them, and I'm looking at and I'm like, God, why do they look so, because they're not super big muscular like a bodybuilder is today, because back then they didn't have steroids and stuff like that. They made them muscular, but they weren't like absurdly muscular, but you look at them, and they just look so powerful, and I'm like, oh, it's their obliques. They all have like, the sculptors made them have these incredible obliques. And then I realized, because at the time I was also into judo, jiu-jitsu, wrestling, and I noticed like all the best like wrestlers and grapplers who were also pretty lean, 
when you look at their core, they've all got these monster obliques. Yeah. And then you look at other athletes, football players, you big ass obliques. Look at the uh, look at uh, you know MMA fighters or whatever. Just these incredible obliques, very important muscles for your oh, body. Dude, and when you move left to right like constantly, and like you have to change directions all the time, how the fuck are you going to stabilize everything without obliques? Look at look at CrossFit athletes, like yeah. the top ones. You know because they're doing all these crazy lifts. Incredible obliques are very very important, so don't neglect those. But you know the concept behind the No BS Six Pack Formula really it's it's taking maps type programming and putting it into core training. And really it's about understanding that you can build the muscles of the core like you can with the rest of the body. And if you build your abs, they're more they're gonna be more visible at higher body fat percentages. I learned this for myself. It used to be I used to have to get to seven or eight percent to have a six pack. Now I have a six pack at ten percent body fat. And it's because I built my abs so they could stick out a little bit. So I said, I thought to myself, wow, this would be cool if I could put this into a program so people could also do this. And because it's hard to get people lean, but if you teach them how to train right and they build their abs, boom. And it, it, just, it just so happens to be free this month. That's right. That's <laughs> yeah, right. There you go. Next question is from Mikey V Fitness What were the biggest revenue enhancers for your personal training businesses? What is your best advice for an independent trainer to grow their business? Ooh. Yeah. Right off the top of my head, the first thing I can think about was when I figured out that I to, to provide more than just fitness value uh, to my clients. So what I mean by that is once my clients, there was a big switch that happened about halfway through my career where in the first half, people would call me if they were hurt uh, and they'd have to cancel. Like, oh man, my back's kind of tweaked. I don't know if I can work out today. And I'd say, okay, well, when you get better, let me know. And then we'll, we'll get you back on the schedule. And then there was a switch where people would call me instead and say, hey, Sal, I know we're not supposed to work out till Wednesday, but I kind of tweaked my back. Can I come in early so you can help me out? Once I was able to provide that kind of value to my clients where they could come see me if they were kind of hurting or feeling tense or tight in their neck or their back was bothering them or their knee was bothering them, then people, I, people stopped canceling with me and people started to want to see me more often uh, not just for workouts for fitness, but for workouts to make them feel better. That was a huge game changer for me that, like I said, happened probably about halfway through. You know, I'm glad you went that way because I'm going to go a completely different direction. And I, I totally agree with Sal, that, you know, getting educated enough to where you become your client's resource from any, for anything health or wellness is, is a good goal to have. And I think if you're going to become an elite trainer, you want to become, and I remember when that, that shift happened for me and it took quite a few years for me. I had been training for over five years before I had that kind of confidence to where my clients had that much confidence in me, where anything that was going on with them health wise at all, or anyone they knew, they would always call and reach out to me. But when, when talking about enhancing like revenue in your personal training business, the thing that I taught most of my trainers that uh, for sure were the most successful ones, the ones that actually applied this uh, was this. And I, and I didn't know anybody else in my, my space at this time that really taught trainers to do this, which was to break down it, break the business down mathematically. And everybody, everybody, you can't control, like if we were to compare, if Mikey, you and I were to compare each other how good are you at closing sales or selling people person training and you're comparing to me, you know, you can't do that. It's just not fair. I've had tons of years experience. It's something that I like to do. Maybe you're not a good sales guy or you don't even like sales, but that doesn't mean that you still don't have the same potential to make as much money as I do or produce a business as successful. It may mean you have to work a little harder for it, but getting to the bottom of your numbers, your average is so important, I think. So what I would teach them to do is this. Get, first of all, get as many people as you possibly can in front of you for free. And I think a lot of trainers today are fucking lazy. They don't want to put the effort and the work into training someone and not getting paid. I looked at it like if I was going to become a master at my craft, I've got to get 5,000 hours or 10,000 hours, I think is what it is they consider to become a master under my belt. So that's a lot of clients that I got to train before I'm even considered a master like what Sal's talking about. So I need reps. And while I'm getting these reps... I should be tracking. I should be seeing how I'm doing here. Like, how many people do I have to see before one of them buys? Everybody in this room, everybody that's listening that's a personal trainer has a number. 
you have an average you have an average closing percentage and you have an average dollar per sale you just probably never sat down to put the work in to figure that shit out and so i would teach trainers to track that i wouldn't hold them accountable to how much they had to make or setting their goals yet until we figured out what they're capable of and so you say you you see 20 free appointments write them all down out of those 20 how many of those people actually purchase something from you out of that, whatever that percentage is, how much money did, did they spend? And then you figure out the average dollar amount per unit. Now I have something that I can measure and I can say, now you have a real fucking business plan. Now I can say, okay, it takes me 20 free appointments before I can even get three people to buy from me at an average dollar amount of $500. So that's $1,500, right? I can make $1,500 off of 20 appointments. So if I have 20 appointments to make $1,500 and I want to make $10,000 a month, how many people do I need to see? And go after your business that way. And guess what? If you put in that work and you put those reps in, what do you think is going to naturally happen? That's right. You want to hear something crazy? You said about five years you started to put that together. Yeah. So I just did the math. 10,000 hours divided by 40 hours a week is about five years. <laughs> Funny, right? Isn't that weird? Because yeah. the same thing with me. It so took 10, about that long. Hours rule, yeah. yeah, about, about it, full time, about five years, and then you get you become a master. So you yeah. should already be, you should not, if you're at hour 500 of being a personal trainer and you're trying to be this badass trainer and have a huge business. You'll get there faster if you do more of it. Right, you'll yeah. get there faster <laughs> if you start putting the reps in and while you're putting the reps in, track your shit. Track your shit and then and then set yourself. And so what I would do is I would first teach my trainers that. And then what I would what I would see, and this of course you would think I had average of a staff of fifteen to twenty, had someone like a Justin who'd be working with me. Now what I would find was someone like Justin, Justin maybe not ha- would not have to see as many appointments. And most of his appointments would show up and his the sales packages that he would sell would be a bigger pop than the average trainer. Mm-hmm. Then I'd have some other trainers that have to see a lot more and they'd get a, a little less sales, but then they'd have even a larger pop. So you're yeah. going to, and then I can, I can coach to that trainer. You just got to find that, your that's number. That's the perfect setup for me too. And what I was going to talk about, because he mentioned independent training. And I think that, and I applied those exact strategies when I used to work for you. Um, and that was something that was very revealing about my business. And then the next big thing for me was figuring out now, okay, how can I actually like get the ultimate client, the ultimate client that I want, the one that's going to pay me, you know, as much money for my time as I feel, you know, my value will match. And then, you know, how can I raise my value and how can I kind of flirt the boundaries with that more? And how can I sell these big pops? And what that's going to do is allow a lot more free time in my schedule. I don't have to train as many clients. And just that freedom allows creativity for me. I'm a very creative person. This was like a very appealing business strategy for me. So I actually took that and then then applied it as an independent trainer um, and and really just was the first to uh, create a website for himself, which was a differentiating factor, right? So I was there in Golds where we actually were allowed to advertise ourselves on the sheet. And so it was like one binder and everybody had like a sheet. And so I've, the first thing I, I figured out was who's the best, right? Who's the best? And then re-engineering that. And then, you know, Dave Padalero at the time was like the guy. And so, you know, I, I really looked at him and his strategies and then just evolved my own strategies. And this, this was based off of that concept of how do I, how do I attract that, that ultimate client? Well, I have to, I have to really personify this person. I have to figure out you know, their habits. I have to figure out what they're into. Like, you know, what, what, what really kind of stood out for me was that this person, like they want, they want like access anytime, you know, like their, 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 their schedule is chaotic. They want you to be able to handle it. They want you to take care of things. Right. So my whole strategy started to feed into that. And then I learned more about how to market myself online through Google ads and then Google ads, I figured out the right keyword. And then, you know, anyway, so you just get, you get further and further and you figure out like, like your exact goal. Like my goal was to, to basically train about four or five clients and have nothing but free time and make more money than I'm making right now. 
and, and I did it. And it's all just a matter of putting it into practice, you know, and, and, and realizing if I put a thousand dollars in advertising this month, what's my return on that? And then you like do all the numbers and you see, you know, and you base it off of that, your strategy you, working or not. You got to take the mystery out of it all. You know how many trainers run around in this like land of mystery? Oh, I know. And they have one huge month where they make ten, fifteen thousand dollars and they have another month where they do And they don't 000. know how and you ask them what, right. well, what's going on. Well, I don't know. I think it's slow. And well, how many people did you see? How many people did you talk to? How many appointments did you have? How yeah. many people showed up? How many people? They don't know that. So really it's just taking the mystery out, figure out your number and then push that, you know, press that rather than saying, because it's... It's very mysterious if you say to yourself, I need to make, you know, $8,000 a month. Okay, well, that's great, but that sounds very kind of out there, like mysterious. Why don't you break it down and figure out how many appointments that would you want to make? Yeah. Yeah. What is that? How many appointments does that, does that look like? And then you back it up, like what Adam says, and you figure, okay, I need to see, you know, 50 people a month or mm-hmm. 30 people, whatever the number is, 30 people a month based off of my, my closing, closing percentage, yeah. based on how many people show up. Because what will happen is you'll book so many appointments, so many of them will show up, and then so many of them will hire you, and then you'll have an average dollar per sale. And that's it. That's literally all it is. And then what you could do is you could tweak the number. You may find that, wow, I only have a 30% show percentage. Well, what happens if I call these people two times before the appointment right, to confirm them? Up. Or make it more enticing yeah. to come. Yeah. Oh, now I have a 60% show percentage. Or you may, sh- may see like, wow, I only have a 25% closing percentage. How can I improve my ability to close people? Or you may say, show percentage is good, closing percentage is good, my dollar per sale isn't good. How can I increase that? And you start playing with these things here and there. And it's not mysterious yeah. because there's nothing worse than being a trainer, an independent trainer, and have and making so X amount of dollars and not knowing how. Yeah. Well, not knowing how it happened. That's that's terrible. That's and chaos. It, and it I I mean, God, I'm so I'm such a numbers person when it comes to I started doing this when I first started and I remember I was closing, I was only closing at about twenty eight percent. So my close, my close percentage was about 28%. When I left the company, I was like 87%. Hmm. So over the course of the 10 years that I was there, I continued to refine my skills. And the way I refined my skills was just getting reps, was getting people in front of me, learning what to do, what not to do. Like Justin saying, finding out what clients are better for me. And so you just start to refine that. And what's awesome is if I, if I set my goals for the month that, okay, this month I want to make $10,000, and I'm brand new and I'm just starting and my closing percentage is only 25% or so, which isn't great whatsoever. In fact, that was what, you know, 24-hour fitness back in the day, that was the company benchmark for all trainers was to be about 25% closing on all free appointments. So I was performing when I first started at about at what they wanted the, the company benchmark for, for trainers to be at. And over time, I, I progressed it. Well, but I always drew my business plan up as if I was only closing at 25%. So when I closed at 85%, that $10,000 a month could turn into a twenty or a $30,000 a month because I was just, but I put the work in as if I was only going to get 25%. And some months you're going to get luckier. Some months you're going to get lay downs. You're going to have people that come in and say, hey, I just want training from you. Or I, they, they're, yeah. are, they're, they're uh, an easy three or four in a row. Like that's going to happen. But what, tra- what I used to see trainers would do is then they let off the throttle. Oh, they, they just sold this big package. They basically hit their nut for the month. And then all of a sudden, they don't do any of those appointments for the rest of the month. And they're like, oh, I'll worry about next month when it comes. Like, I already I already made eight grand this month. It's like, no, like, you need to work like you're closing at 25%. You know how many people you need to see. And guess what's going to happen? If you get lucky and you make your nut within the first week, you're about to have probably one of the biggest months of your life if you continue following through your plan. But a lot of the trainers that you know worked for me, they didn't have this built into them, so I had to train them mm. how to do it. And I remember my my boss at the time always tripping out because we would have like a, I used to do free fitness Fridays, and I would teach my trainers to do like we would schedule on because Fridays everyone knows after about two o'clock the Friday gym kind of dies off because everybody's getting ready for the weekend or taking off, and so it would be a poor revenue for my club. And so I was trying to make Fridays big revenue days. And so the way I did it was I got all my trainers on board and that was the day we did free workouts. All of my staff did. So I wanted my trainers to have anywhere between two to five appointments on Fridays that were free. And then I could tell my boss, I could say, okay, so I would know, he wouldn't know this, but I would know, okay, we've booked as a team, all of us, 50 appointments in coming in. And then I'd say to him, hey, you know, Ben, guess what? On Friday, 
we're going to do probably about 17 grand or so. And be like, what? Are you, how do you know that? I'm like, I just know. And he'd be like, how do you, I don't understand. How do you, and then we would fall somewhere right around there. And the reason why I knew that is because I knew what all of my trainers closed on average. I knew what I closed on average. I knew how many total appointments were. I knew some people weren't going to show up. I knew we'd probably get a deal or two that was lucky. We'll get one that didn't turn out well. And it all averaged pretty close to what everyone's average is. And then I could start to predict where we were revenue-wise. And that's Mm -hmm. how you run a fucking business. So as an independent contractor... You've got to learn to think like that, like you're operating a multi-million dollar business, and exactly how they would break it. And down. by the way, if you're a, if you do, if you practice and you're halfway decent, and you kind of have a good, you know, goal assessment and presentation, you should be able to close around fifty percent. I, I can expect that from pretty much most people uh, if they take it seriously and practice. Whatever, if you're really good. Then you get uh, higher than that, but fifty percent you can. You think fifty percent? I think most. I can get. I can get pretty much anybody to close at fifty. Oh, you could get someone. Oh, yeah, you yeah, could yeah. develop them to yep, get there. Yep, now. yep. Well, I don't want people to think that that's normal because it's not normal. No, but, I'm saying. No, I'll take work. I'm saying most people, most people who apply themselves and practice and stuff should be able to get around fifty percent. Now you got the gifted people who are going to do much better than that, and you've got other people who have to work a lot harder than that. But in my experience, about fifty, I could get most people to close. Uh, at about fifty percent, and you know the the twenty five percent benchmark that that you know the company set at the time, obviously they wanted to make sure that like this is what you have to do or whatever. Right, but, right. But, and I, and I think that's the way you said it that way. Yep. So you, I just want people to know, like if you train, if you practice, and you take you make it serious, you take it seriously, and you practice your goal assessment, and you practice your presentation, and all that stuff, you should be able to close. You know, one out of every two people you see, roughly, generally, right around there, which isn't bad. And then, I mean, here's the cool thing about being a personal trainer, especially on your own. You don't need a shit ton of clients. You figure you train the average person twice a week. You want to work, you know, 30, 30 to 40 sessions a week. How many clients, you know, how many clients is that? It's not a ton of people. So within, uh, you know, within a couple months, if you book enough appointments, you can get yourself to full time if you can close well. Um, and, and or, or or semi well and just apply yourself. Well, this is so yeah. important too because we still okay we are still doing this today and this is part of what I kind of look at the most with the business because I'm at home on the numbers all the time. But we are still applying the same exact tip that I just give you right now currently to grow this business. It's just now it's the apl- same thing to apply. Anyway. It's, it's it's now applied in our emails. And the way we and our lead magnets. So think of like a free appointment, just like our lead magnet that goes out on Facebook, right? We pay for advertising going. Mm-hmm. That is me booking an appointment. They mm-hmm. if I can if I can put out enough good information to convince these people to download this free thing that we've provided for them, which should be pretty easy if you're offering a free service to them, to get their email. That's like showing up to an appointment. I got your email. You're showing up to see me. Now I have a chance to send you more information to build even more value. Me. That's our email sequencing. The open rate, okay? People, I look at that all the time. Are we? Are people opening up or are they just disregarding the email? Well, if they're just disregarding it, that's like my show percentage. Well, people aren't showing up. Why aren't they showing up? Well, I'm probably not setting up my appointment very well or my email sequencing isn't providing enough value to make them want to open it. So there's tweaks that I can make there. And then how many people at the end of this email sequence actually buy one of our programs from us? Well, if it's very low then we're probably not providing enough value before we're asking for the sale. So I need to go back and revisit that. Or if I know that we're closing at X amount and we want to make X amount of dollars this month, I know we have to push out so much money in advertising for Facebook to get in these new leads. It's no different. So you got to learn this. If you're going to build a real big business, like bigger than just your own little private personal dream is, and you have dreams to grow it to be huge one day, you're going to need to learn this formula because it, it will it will continue to live within your business no matter what Dude, you do. I don't see how an independent trainer can be successful long term without understanding this anyway. Right. I don't think anybody. I mean, if you don't understand this, you're going to be in a constant flux of mysterious big months and mysterious bad months with all your effort, and it's going to suck. Your business is going to suck, and a lot of trainers do this. A lot of trainers have where they look at their total year, how much they made, but it looks like some months were good, some months were bad. They don't know how much money they can expect to make or whatever, and they don't yeah. know what it looks like. That's not That's a good like place to be. That's like the only area we get super frustrated with podcasting is like they give us only like one metric and it's super weak you yep, know, yep, as far yep. as analytics uh, go. But good point, yeah. good point. So uh, check this out. Go to the app uh, store. Get the Mind Pump Media app. It's free. It allows you to search for topics in our episodes and you can find... Whatever episode we talk about, whatever topic, 
you want to hear about. And it's absolutely free. It's the Mind Pump Media app. Thank you for listening to Mind Pump. If your goal is to build and shape your body, dramatically improve your health and energy, and maximize your overall performance, check out our discounted RGB Super Bundle at mindpumpmedia.com. The RGB Super Bundle includes MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, and MAPS Aesthetic. Nine months of phased expert exercise programming designed by Sal, Adam, and Justin to systematically transform the way your body looks, feels, and performs. With detailed workout blueprints and over 200 videos, the RGB Super Bundle is like having Sal, Adam, and Justin as your own personal trainers, but at a fraction of the price. The RGB Super Bundle has a full 30-day money-back guarantee, and you can get it now plus other valuable free resources at mindpumpmedia.com. If you enjoy this show, please share the love by leaving us a five-star rating and review on iTunes and by introducing Mind Pump to your friends and family. We thank you for your support, and until next time, this is Mind Pump.